and listening to to the blues and uh, I mean you're fantastic on the guitar man oh thank yeah. you yeah <laughs> cool cool yeah well it's my it's really one of my dreams to come to South Africa and just play for people you know because I feel you know from what little I know about the history I feel a great kinship with yeah. the struggle of the people there and I know that you know for 100 years we've had especially in the last century and of course you can speak more on this there have been a lot of contacts even my own mother has been to South Africa back in the 90s she went there on a conference and uh, was just you know gushing about it so I look forward to that at some point yeah no I mean South Africa like every uh you know well in general, wherever, you know, go visiting the continent in general. Um, but, um, you know, South Africa has its own particular story and uniqueness within the broader history of, of Black people's struggle. And um, it's, a, it's a country of pain and joy. It's a country of exhilaration and tragedy. You know, you've got all this, all this in one, you know. Um, yeah, so... I mean, obviously, it would be wonderful to have you, and uh, I'm sure stuff can be worked out through some of the things that you know have brought us together, UVA, etc. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Looking forward to that. So, um, I'm interested, really, uh, to start out this conversation um, with you telling us, in general, about the ancient history of civilization in South Africa. I have been, um, you know, as many of us do, I search on the internet for things I'm interested in. And I, I've come across several articles that um, have talked about extremely ancient urban um, um, metropolises, if I can use that word, in South Africa. So I was wondering if you could speak about that, speak about exactly how old we're talking about and how that fits in to the wider, um, uh, context of uh, ancient African history and what was going on back in those ancient times. Yeah. I mean, you know, South Africa is such a, it's such a, it's like, it's, it's such an ancient, I mean, the fact that it's called South Africa is always a problem for some black South Africans because the word, the name South Africa isn't really the name that, um, kind of exemplifies the history of Africans here, you know, South Africa is really the name that the colonialists gave to the place. So one is always wishing for some other kind of name for this country that actually exemplifies the, indig the indigeneity of the place. Um, we, yeah, I, I mean, if you just go back, the history of humanity as a whole just the history of human beings, before we even start talking about the cultural history of Africans here, just the history of human beings in the world, you know? I mean, we all know that Africa is the cradle of all humankind, but um, there's so much rich, like paleontology, then like archeology span in South Africa. And I wonder sometimes if a lot of it has been preserved because some of the parts of South Africa where a lot of this preservation of artifacts is is in the dry parts of South Africa. So some of these artifacts that you see of just ancient, ancient, ancient human occupation here in, in, on the continent, um, you just, you know, you can just walk through certain parts of South Africa and you're just like walking over arrowheads, <laughs> you know, you're picking them up everywhere. In fact, here in my garden, my husband, uh, I, was, I had asked him to, to dig something up and then he dug up a, in fact, I cannot, I'd stand up and fetch it, but he dug up this, the stone X. And I, I just took one look at it and I was just like, this thing will be not, probably looks like the kind of um, ancient hominid, ancient early human, early, early ancestral human, pre-human ancestor about 500,000 years ago. So South Africa is like, you can't, like the history of humanity, like you can't even, it's so hard to describe how much of it can be found here. And then when we start looking at the cultural history of humanity, we're looking at evidence of already 80 to 100,000 years of human cultural occupation. So when we can see human beings beginning to draw things and 
you know, making artifacts. Now, what's interesting is that um, the reason why this is important is because for a long time, the cultural history of humanity was seen as a European like advancement. So they would go to the caves in France and see like, you know, paintings on the walls and they'd be like, aha, this is the earliest expression of the human cognitive, what, what, what. You know, the stuff in South Africa predates all of much of what is in Europe by like 50 to 60,000 years, you know? So if you wanna look at where human beings, where our intelligence, where our cultural sensibility comes from, whatever it is, Oka, draw, you, you find the stuff, a lot of the evidence in South Africa. So that's just looking at the so-called natural origins of humanity and it's, it's astounding. It's astounding. Like that just even you, you I, I imagine if I took a time machine and I was still here where I'm living now, and then I just went back like a hundred thousand years, I'm gonna see some of the earliest families of human beings living here before they spread out the cultural humanity on the rest of the planet. I'm gonna find the first ancestors of cultural humanity here. It's amazing. Everything, the beadwork they did, you know, well, we assume it's beadwork, but you know, sometimes with the, it's interesting when, because a lot of the, a lot of that, uh, like old, old archeology, span a lot of the people in that field are sort of white archeologists and, and paleontologists. And I don't mind that, you know, it's kind of like, it takes a while to transform a field and put in the black people there. But sometimes it's like, they, they I love the way they sometimes just make, strange guesses about what it is that was going on, you know, you know, and then the guesses are so obscure. And I'm like, you know, I bet if I went back into that time, given some of the ritual and cultural inheritances I have as an African, I probably would understand what those people were doing a hundred thousand years ago. Um, I wouldn't need some obscure colonial anthropology to kind of interpret. So yeah and then of course there's the history of the 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 the, the, the longest standing um human uh group on the planet um uh and those are the the sand people so with all the genetic and cultural continuity um who who really uh have yeah i just it's like when you want to understand ancient you know cultural ancestral humanity that's still with us. You're looking at the sand people, sometimes called uh, the Bushman people, and that, that, that there's contention around that term. Um, but otherwise, all their knowledge of, you know, scientific knowledge of this environment, pharmacology, you know, uh, engineering uh, stone artifacts through fire, the, their knowledge of the stars, their knowledge of the environment and the seasons, you know, these are people who lived across Southern Africa, you know, they were just in South Africa, across Namibia, Angola, East, East Africa, moving up and down here, you know, uh, refining their knowledge of this environment, learning how to, you know, live amongst the animals, but also, you know, living as, 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 as human beings who also live off the land. So that's like, there's a whole history of that. You know, 20, 30,000 years, those people are still here. I don't know, you know, it's the Australian Aboriginal communities and the San communities together, the, some of the oldest cultural continuities that we, we just live with today. You know, their symbolisms, their rituals, their knowledge of the environment, you know. So some of that knowledge, by the way, when I put uh, Corey, they, you know, there've been all these international corporations that come to try and suss out what people know here in terms of the pharmacology of <laughs> plants. So there've been several problems with international corporations coming into South Africa, taking the indigenous knowledge, um, particularly of the sand people over various plants, because some plants are unique to South Africa, right? So, and these people know uh, their descendants, at least, they've got all this knowledge, and that comes. And you know, in the past, these people would have been like, "Oh, these are primitive savages." And then here, here they are, mm -hmm. extracting uh, like 
tens of thousands of years of, of, of uh, scientific knowledge of the communities that continue to inhabit Southern Africa. Mm. So those are the sort of old, and then of course, later on in Southern Africa, you started getting, um, you know, different kinds of Africans with uh, different ways of living. So uh, sheep herding, cattle herding, um, met metal, um, metal making societies, uh, sort of uh, building new uh, alliances and ways of life in Southern Africa, giving rise to uh, what I suppose what people consider more formal civilization, whatever, <laughs> whatever that is, you know. Um, and so you had, you know, the rise of these iron wielding civilizations or about already about 1,500 years ago um, mm -hmm. in Zimbabwe, in the northern part of South Africa, in Botswana, you know, and, and yeah, and those civilizations really, I consider them children of the ancient, <laughs> you know, the ancient 20,000, 30,000 year old, you know, 40,000 year old, maybe sand civilizations, because really the basis of a lot of what is Southern Africa is those sand uh, slash so-called Bushman civilizations, those ancient hunter-gatherers who kind of set up all the scientific knowledge of the Southern Africa. Then when other Africans are migrating in and out and they build the new civilizations, all of that, even a lot of our rituals we take primarily from the, the sand uh, groupings that used to, that have sort of uh, lived here. I mean, there's always a lot of contention about, oh, do we identify these people as San or whatever? It, it, there's always issues with what names you use for, 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 for ancient Africans. But either way, I consider them ancestral Africans to all of us. Mm -hmm. so, they, uh, so they lay a foundation. So when all these different new forms of living emerge, now you've got these stone building civilizations in Zimbabwe, you've got um, you know, a gold mining civilizations, uh, Salt pen, salt mining, um, salt mining, a big thing because there's a lot of salt. I don't know what you call them uh, ecologically, a lot of salt, natural salt bearing areas from Botswana across. So salt trade is a big, big deal in Southern Africa. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of, so a lot of that, and I mean, there's just so much. <laughs> I don't know mm -hmm. if I could get through mm -hmm. any of it because you've got all the whole range of human typology of living in southern africa before the white people came <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what when you're talking about the sun it makes me think of the baka or the bata the forest yes. people yes um are they related um, it, it related, yes, insofar as all Africans are related, if you know what I'm saying, like every, every African is related, you know, in some form, but the name Abatwa um, kind of got transposed from those Batwa clans in, you know, East, East Africa, and that name became a kind of a generic name used to describe, um, in many ways, hunter-gatherer style uh, type of, 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 of people. So you can see there was this uh, transference of language where the, 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 the cattle and, 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 um, and farming Africans kind of used that nomenclature of the Batwa to then describe these hunter-gatherers that um, exist even in Southern Africa. So that it's not it's not necessarily a direct genetic link. Of course, there's cultural unity across much of the continent or cultural similarity. But that particular name was extrapolated from there and then used by um, farming Africans to describe. I guess they looked and they were like, okay, these are also sort of forest for hunter gathering, and then yeah. here as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's a lot. I mean, oh, we could go into so much about the 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 the, 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 the just the, the the latest civilizational histories. I mean, 
one of the things, I mean, I always say to students when Zimbabwe was colonized, the reason that Zimbabwe was colonized is because the whites were looking for gold. And the reason the whites were looking for gold is because they'd heard that there was all this gold mining and then that had been happening in ancient, in that region in the ancient, you know, period. And so they thought the, 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 the British thought when they got there, they'd also find gold because there was also gold in South Africa. And they got to Zimbabwe and find that pretty much all the gold had been mined out by the indigenous people over, you know, a very long time they'd been doing that, you know. But that gave rise to that uh, famous colonial book by Ryder Haggard called King Solomon's Mines. Uh, I believe there's a film with Sharon Stone <laughs> based on that book, yeah. But King Solomon's Mines was based on that imagination that the Europeans had, that there was gold mining somewhere in the middle of Africa and Southern Africa. And then they, in their European legends, because of how much gold had flowed from Southern Africa into the world in the ancient world, the Europeans created legends um, of, 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 of these secret, you know, of these secret places somewhere in Africa where, you know, all this gold could be found. And um, they also assumed that these mines were serving, uh, well, in some of the legend that the mines was, were, were serving a Phoenician civilization. So these mines had been Phoenician. <laughs> they had to go find Phoenicians to answer the question of the gold. So there was all this beautiful European superstition <laughs> about mm -hmm. the African mines. But the reality was these were just uh, gold mining had uh, clearly had a very long history, especially in, in the Limpopo and Zimbabwe area. So it wasn't a mystery to the Africans that the gold had disappeared because they'd mined it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for close on 1,500 years. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So um, do you know anything? Uh, I don't know the name of the discovery, but I was... Uh, reading about the specific uh, discovery I mentioned a few minutes ago, and they said the antiquity was something like 100,000, oh, 150,000. Of the stones. Yes. I've seen that. Um, the, the, okay, so let me just explain the situation of the knowledge of those people and why they also get shrouded sometimes in our own modern mythology. So when the Europeans arrived, they did basically two things. They decimated the indigenous people and then occupied these places as farmland, right? So, the, so that then it kills, uh, you know, a lot of cultural memory. You know, you can look at a place and not realize that here were whole villages that were burned to the ground when these colonists arrived. That was the first thing they did. They, they kind of, the land was erased <laughs> so they could occupy with their farms. Then the second thing that happened was whenever they found evidence of, of African, long African occupation in, in Southern Africa, what they would do is they would hide it. They would literally take the artifacts and put them in a, put them far away, or they would, um, they would just let, they wouldn't, they wouldn't uh, want to admit that there were longstanding um, civilizational Africans in the way we mm. talk about civilization in these places. So what that mm. does over time, over a century or, or maybe two centuries of white occupation, it just kills the memory of what was actually happening there. So now more recently, what has happened is the, there's been quite a lot of technology that has been able to, from above, look down. So they use a laser. So these, they use a laser and then this, this laser can Light, actually- Is it LIDAR? Yes. Mm -hmm. That thing. And then it can, that's it. So they can see all this pattern of, of, of occupation. Um, but also I think with a lot of the, the changes that have happened, a lot of farms and a lot of farmers, you know, They've, they've been a little bit more open now about saying, okay, look, actually on this farm, on that corner is an ancient uh, stone site that we found here. Now, if I was to, just using my knowledge of Southern Africa, if I was to kind of date that stuff, I would probably date it to only about 
2000 to 1000 years ago, some of it, if not 1005, 800 years ago, because it follows the same pattern that we see in Zimbabwe and so on. So sometimes what happens, I think, is the stuff gets shrouded in new mythologies because it's like it hasn't been seen in a very long time. So people will date things as 100,000 years when they may be 2,000 or 1,000 years, um, uh, simply because it's oh, for South Africa. They, they have made, in South Africa, there's been so much erasure that the finding of anything becomes very exciting. Mm. So amateur, um, I wouldn't say amateur, but people who aren't necessarily the archeological, have, don't, who don't have the equipment or whatever may start reading much older into that. And I, I, on one hand, I think it's okay, but on the other, I don't like distorting the history of black people because it, it, you could probably trace through living descendants, the people that used to occupy those lands. So once it becomes so ancient as to be unknown, I don't like it because Actually, you may find that those sites were occupied by people that we could actually figure out today where they were displaced. So you could probably find, would you know what, on Van der Stel's farm, which, you know, was now a white owned farm, there's a, there's a, 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 a stone kraal. And then if we did the research, we may discover actually it was this and this clan at this and this time, and this is how they were removed from the land and this is how long and then you have to go back to those people and say what's your oral traditions and tell now, the I people what a crawl is oh the, a the crawl yeah. yes a crawl what is a crawl <laughs> what is a crawl in it? a crawl is i just realized that that word is the word it's just the, the word in english a crawl is a place where you keep animals where you keep cattle, but it's more than that. Mm -hmm. Kral is the, 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 the word kral, I think, is a Afrikaans word that has now become the, the main word for describing what we would call ismaya. Mm -hmm. So ismaya is, is where you keep the cattle. I think it was a cattle pen or it's a livestock pen. But in the Southern African language, it's not a pain. It's not a. It's not a holding area. It's more than that. <laughs> it's like when I when you say ismaya, you meaning whole social arrangement, mm -hmm. which revolves around the value of these animals. So yeah. and then crawl kind of just it's so in use here. So yes, it's where you keep animals. So my point is, um, I like to be able to say, here's the evidence that we lived here. Not that we need to prove it. But it's beautiful for us when we can show it to ourselves. And I would like to go and find out who was the last living, Af who was the last group of Africans or family of Africans that lived here before this white occupation arrived. And we should be able to do that. And, 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 and I, and so I, uh, the, the ancient mythologies must then follow our oral traditions and not take on a weird, mysterious, unknowable mystery. Especially when white, when white uh, mystery, you know, white, there's certain kinds of white writers, Corey, yeah. who can take an African thing and then mystify it. And it's like, ooh, it's so Alien. exotic. <laughs> I don't want those guys. They're fine for fiction and for enjoying yeah. Hollywood. There yeah. are people that know exactly who used to live there. Mm -hmm. we, and there will be archives. That land was occupied by Africans. We need to know who occupied there and not get lost in Exotica when we can actually find out who used to occupy. But isn't it all that mystifying, all that uh, ridiculous conjecture, isn't it just an exercise in anti-Africanity, anti-Africanness, trying to, as you were talking about, hide the culture hide the story from the people. To me, it feels like that because I very much enjoy uh, mysterious things, but we've got a history where 
when things are turned into uh, fictional mythologies by sort of white or European writers, they do it from their perspective. So they do it from their lens. So that's why you have the whole mythology of King Solomon's minds captivating Europeans. They couldn't come to terms with the fact that actually they are living Africans who can tell you who minds in Zimbabwe, who lives here, what the skill sets are. They can't see it as a scientific advance of these people. They would rather see it as an exotic adventure into the, the heart of darkness in which there is all this strange exotica. Yeah. You don't want to know who these Africans are. I, we don't care if you don't want to know who they are. We need to know who we are. So it's okay. Yeah. They can they can tell that story. We can even play with those things if they sell films. I don't care. But mm -hmm. from teaching the kids, we must be able to say, hey, there used to be an old man who knew how this gold was mined, where mm -hmm. it was then transported so that this mm -hmm. gold could go from Zimbabwe to uh, the, the to Mozambique, and then be transported from Mozambique up mm. to the coast of you know uh, Kenya or or Tanzania, and then from there it would make its way to India, China, wherever. Mm -hmm. Those were Africans that were doing that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So True. there's a there's a duty to stay within the history of humanity because it's easy to take us out of it by turning our uh, scientific and technological and metallurgical advancements into King Solomon's minds. Ooh, there's a witch doctor somewhere. We don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's fine. I don't mind entertainment. I love it, but yeah, we must. Yeah, yeah we got to know the difference, right? Got to know the difference because then the, that thing feeds into the idea that Africans can only know the world through mysterious incantations as opposed mm -hmm. to actual both, I like mysterious incantations, they're good, <laughs> I like them, mm -hmm. but uh, we also observe the world. Otherwise, how did the sun people know how to extract poison from the plants in their environment and how to then measure that so that when they killed it, when they hunted an animal, the poison didn't, you know, poison, toxify the whole animal. It's, how did they do that? Uh, yeah. They did what Isaac Newton did. They observed it and they tested it and they looked in their own way and they were like, oh, this amount works in these proportions and, you know, we must then do this and, blah, 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 and then this is how we're going to get meat. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they did incantations. But so for me, like, it's so important because otherwise they forget that the, the scientific paradigm for me originates with these Africans that learned this environment and enabled human beings to then move off and occupy the rest of the planet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's the story of the world to me. It's there were a bunch of people in Africa, very, very, very interesting creatures, very intelligent humans with cultural histories. They observed, they tested, they, incan they made incantations when they had to, and mm -hmm. they occupied the planet for better or for worse, but they came from here. Mm -hmm. They didn't come from Europe. They look like me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like us. Yes, indeed. Yes, yes, yes. So true. You know, when you were uh, making the reference to King Solomon's minds and talking about the European uh, need to um, mystify the story, it made me think of a particular group of people in South Africa who have claimed and also DNA uh, science, I believe, has backed this up. They have claimed roots from the Levant, roots yes. from mm. Jewish peoples. Who are those people? The Lemba. The Lemba. The Lemba, yes. Oh, yes. So, you know, I love science, but sometimes also I understand why human beings need to check into things because their oral traditions tell us that they uh basically i don't want to get it wrong but they relate themselves to the children of israel yeah. and then they uh, came down with various they, then some of their oral tradition says they would have had certain religious artifacts which they had to preserve and come down and you know and then they came down and basically you know um you know they uh they then found themselves in southern africa so now some of the DNA evidence says, yes, you do have 
uh, Levant, well, no, you do have like um, DNA that says that you definitely are not, you are coming from these Middle Eastern parts. But the, 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 the DNA can only seems to, well, it seems to suggest that, well, but probably you were the children of Swahili traders. Uh, uh, so so it's, it stops there. And then I'm like, if you know Lemba people, they have Jewish traditions. <laughs> so the question is, why was that ritual archive passed down onto the Lemba people? If it's the case that they were simply genetically so I, children of those who came to trade, because the trade on the Swahili coast, by the way, is old. Yeah. So, I mean, we tend to think of it, I think, maybe more because of the, 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 the rise of, um, of the Islamic world. So, mm. but if you think of it, that area, uh, ancient, you know, Persia, all these people are trading up and down this African coast, you know, uh, you know, in, in the Roman period. Yes. So I, I, I think these, uh, these Lemba people, they may very well have all this genetic tracing that says, yes, of course, our people did come gradually down and then they eventually settled here, but they kept with them a particular tradition, which mm -hmm. sets them apart from most from almost most Africans that you would know. Mm -hmm. So yes, they're Africans, but they have a ritual archive that's quite distinct. <laughs> they're very different. Mm -hmm. And they are very cohesive as a group. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, one of my aunts, or what, well, what I would call an aunt, an African aunt, um, is a part of the Lemba community. There's something very distinctive about the way they go about doing their, even how they, they attend to the world. So they're very close knit, very, uh, at, at, at the risk of this sounding the wrong way, but they do remind me of how Jewish communities operate, Jewish diaspora communities can operate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They have a method that is quite similar, right mm -hmm. up until the point where a lot of the, a lot of Lemba, there is a preponderance of Lemba professionals in the world in, of South mm -hmm. Africa. Mm -hmm. Because I think the way that community is structured, there's a way, there's something about their whole cohesiveness, their ritualness. They set themselves apart, but they're Africans. They mm -hmm. do things in a way that recognizes everyone around them, but says everyone must know we are different and everyone recognizes and respects that. And then there's a yeah. way they take their children to through through learning and being and education. And they're so coherent in the sense of mm -hmm. being in the world. So they become very high achievers. Mm -hmm. I see. So it needs quite a bit of uh, more oral work and, and, and listening to their particular archive and studying how do you carry that type of their traditions all the way? How do they do that? I'm sure they've taken sound on, they look, they're not, sound on look, they're not, it's not like there's a hundred percent distinct from all the Africans around them because some of the dress, but they do things differently. Their rituals are different. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a beautiful, amazing story. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Wow. Well, yeah. thank you for that. Moving on. Um, when we were discussing archaeology and the need to hide the history of, of a land, of a place. Um, that, of course, leads to land reform, wealth redistribution. So I wondered if you could talk about that history as it um, relates to Southern Africa. Yeah, that is the biggest, uh, most vexing uh, problem that Southern Africa faces. Uh, Zimbabwe, South Africa, uh, Namibia, um, these three countries experienced an enormous amount of land theft in the colonial period and dispossession and displacement. South Africa obviously experienced the most. So South Africa experienced 
basically 90% of the land being taken away from the indigenous people. And then obviously they then gave, I think another 3% and so it became 87%. <laughs> and then 13% was left for Africans. Just think about that. I don't know if it's similar with the US, with indigenous Americans, with the native Americans. I don't know what's similar. But, but yeah, but it's like a total conquest on land. In Zimbabwe, it was about 50%, I think. So you can imagine, if you just look at Zimbabwe now, how with just 50% of land being the issue and how difficult that was, imagine that was how South Africa is, deal, is trying to deal with nine, well, let's just say 87% of the land was taken away from the indigenous people. And taken away over a, over a 300 year period. So what you see in much of the rest of Africa is colonization was relatively brief compared to what you see in South Africa. So the colonizers arrived maybe in the 1880s and then they're gone by the 1960s. In South Africa, they arrived in the 1600s and begin conquering land immediately. And then they, well, they say they colonized, they arrived way before that, but they colonized in the 1600s and they only, mm -hmm release the people in 1994. <laughs> so first to be colonized, last to be released. Mm -hmm. So in that 300 year period, you have a land disposition that is so structurally almost complete that you, to uh, unscrambling this egg is our biggest challenge. And it has to be unscrambled somehow. It can't, the fact that we have this level of land, it, like in more, much of Africa, colonizers didn't take, I mean, Kenya, I think they may have, Kenya is also another one. I forget Kenya sometimes. Kenya is another one. I'm not sure what the stats were in Algeria because Algeria had a similar level, a similar kind of super settler occupation by, by the French, I think. But in South Africa, you, I don't think any other African country experienced what happened here mm -hmm. uh, uh, with the length of time from the 1600s up until 1994, it was constant conquest and brutalization, literally 350 years of it, constant, non-stop, no period in which the colonizer or the white society said, hey, let's stop taking land. No such a period. If you see the history of South Africa like that, you'll understand why South Africa has a lot of violence, a lot of humiliation, a lot of social sickness, very much like what the indigenous Native Americans went through, I think, and also the, um, the indigenous peoples of Australia. We're similar types of settler colonies. So mm -hmm. South Africa, I suppose New Zealand, Australia, the United States, very similar forms of super occupation and also Although it's not different, I would like to set it apart, but parts of South America would have had, you know, total conquest in some way, but there was a lot of differences there. So, but in South Africa, Argentina yeah. Comes Argentina comes to mind. Oh, Argentina, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I remember really, being there. Yeah? Huh? I remember being there and... Um, you know, just asking, um, you know, where are the indigenous people? Because I was looking around and, and and phenotypically the people around me look like Germans and English who were speaking Spanish, you know? And they said, oh, well, they were all killed, you know? And then I asked them about, well, I saw a few black people, but I noticed the black people I saw, they didn't want to look at me. They didn't want to you know, there was none of that, you know? And I said, well, what's up with that? And they said, well, you know, we used to have um, a population of black folks and we killed them, Wow. you know? Yeah, and so you can see that, uh, you know, it's almost like something that's transmitted to the generations that you see another black person, well, we've been conquered, so I'm not going to acknowledge you because that will put me in jeopardy, you yeah. know? That's the vibe I felt, yeah. No, anyway. I fully get that. Yes. So there's like a, a moving away of the eyes. Like, let's not recognize mm -hmm. each other as family here. Mm 
<laughs> we're not family i'm surviving this i get that yeah yeah i mean so those 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 i um, mean south africa it's it's brutal when you think we, and and it's 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 nothing short of a miracle that the country still stands even with the problems that we have now so trying to now deal with the land redistribution when on some sense you have a um, you have a couple of problems because I think that the, the problem is so structured. The South Africa uh, is the most industrialized uh, country on, on the continent. So the, the whole economy is built around the fact that there's been this 300 year process. And mm -hmm. so, you know, black South Africans were made into the pro pro proletariat. So you know, very early on, tied into the cash economy. First, through the conquering of far of, far, of, of land, it being turned into farms, and so you know, the indigenous uh, peoples uh, of the country uh, going from free peoples into farm laborers. Mm -hmm. I don't know of any other African country that can tell me about such a process already in the seventeen hundreds. You know, mm. people are already having to earn a pitiful wage, whether it was you're going to be paid a sheep or you're paid a few Dutch dollars or whatever. In the 1700s, they were turned into workers. And then mm -hmm. later when they discovered uh, gold and diamonds, then that shift became industrial. And then the broader black population or the, you know, was then forced into industrial labor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, so South Africa is, is a strange country in that sense that it's actually, it's like looking at a, it's like looking at, if you look at it globally, it's like seeing, okay, what did uh, European capitalism do? And South Africa is a very good specimen <laughs> mm -hmm. for total transformation, near total transformation and near total conquest. And you can then look at South Africa and look at the US, look at Australia, you know, and you can see similarity. So your indigenous population very quickly not only got dispossessed, but then roped into, you know, this labor, which means that as much as they were trying to keep a, whatever land they could stay on, whatever land they could keep, it was unviable in many ways. They tried to keep the land going, but they're now being forced into being new kinds of urban labor, while you know their the, the, the livestock are dying in the rural areas, the land's being degraded. Um, and so you start getting a new kind of person and a new type of African, an African who kind of is half, you know, in the city, half, half not a resident, tied to the cash economy, but the cash economy is poor, but you can't be viable on your land either. Yeah. So now when you say we need to return land, in principle, we have to, but how do you do that when your population has lost so much footing? Well, it means you need more intelligence about it. You need to start thinking much more broadly. You need to think, okay, well, let's reskill the population. You know, let's think about how to make agriculture central. And the ANC or the African National Congress or the Liberation Party that's in power wasn't prepared for that. They weren't prepared for the reality that Africans have lost their skill on the land. Mm -hmm. Their heart is there. Our heart is there, but our skills are gone because we've been removed um, mm -hmm. and put into this cash economy, which turns you into a very, you know, low grade consumer. You know, you consume all the alcohol, you consume all the processed foods, you consume all the sugar. So you've got this urban population that's got this, you know, like with black Americans, you know, this terrible poverty diet. Um, and so you've got new consumption needs and these consumption needs need money. You're not going to grow your own sugar. You're not going to grow your own pork. You know, you're not going to do these things. So, but you want them, but you also want your land. So you've got a population situation where we have, we, there's a deep desire for it. You know, of course the, 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 the white population is, is largely unwilling to deal with this land problem because all their property value is tied up into it. I think they'd be willing to, portions of them, some of them, they'd be very willing for the government to say, you know what, give them this farmland, you guys sort it out, we don't mind. That, that, I don't think they would they mind a certain level of give them some land. <laughs> what they mind is 
way and how it affects the values, the, the value of property that they have created mm -hmm. based on the industrial wealth, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. based on the wealth they created. And, they are, and the fact that the white South African population is amongst the elites of the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they don't want to wake up and see that, you know, black people are moving into the neighborhood. <laughs> mm -hmm. They don't want to see none of that. So they're kind of begrudgingly difficult about it. Mm -hmm. And then you've got some remainder of, uh, of the white farming population. That's well, not some. When I say some, I mean, there used to be a very large farming population of whites. And then as apartheid was collapsing, their ability to sustain their own farmers was also collapsing. So a lot of the farmers went left farming. The ones that remained, some of them are super commercial. Some of them, you know, they sort of get by. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a strong cultural resonance on the land for many of them. So they don't want to give up their land. They don't want to give up the ways they've treated people on the land. They don't want to give it up, you know. There's, so there's a certain portion of them that's just like, we don't care. We're not giving you anything. Mm -hmm. And that leads to violence. And it's terrible, mm -hmm. but it leads to unstructured kind of violence. It leads to a climate in which in some farming areas in the old sort of really conservative white areas, like a, like a lot of violence on the land, um, which could be resolved if the organized white farming sector said to government, you know what, in good faith, how do we fix this? But they never seem to do things in good faith. It's always, we cultivated, you know, this land. Um, yeah, so they, they haven't lost some of their racist assumptions and that doesn't help when you're trying to solve a problem where there's a lot of potential conflict it doesn't help them either you know? yeah 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 and similar you know similar to in some ways to the story that i know about the united states um one thing that's interesting to me though is you know my ancestors were a captive captive population some of them were indigenous, some of them were Native Americans, um, but we were not, um, we were not on our own land, so to speak, in many cases. In many cases, the ancestors came from West Africa, mostly some from Congo, as you know. Um, and we were, you know, strangers in a strange land. We weren't uh, subject to aliens on our own land in many cases. So what is the history of, of labor was, I, I can't imagine that it was always in Southern Africa, them paying someone a sheep or something of value, there must have been enslavement as well. No, yes, South Africa also had a, has a particular history of enslavement, of, sorry, of, of people being enslaved here. There's a particular kind of specific regional history. So while South Africa didn't go through to the same extent what happened in much of West and much of East Africa, you know, literally just blacks being taken by the boatloads, that wasn't there. Um, actually because the South African coast line seems to be very difficult to navigate. Yeah. So I don't know if the actual coastline is the main reason. The, mm -hmm. the, the, the actual uh, geography of South Africa mm -hmm. makes it difficult to park your boat, go inland and try and fetch a bunch of natives. You know, it's very, I, it, 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 just, it, it was not, easy to do that. But once they occupied properly um, in the 1600s, what they first did in Cape Town, so in the Cape part of South Africa where the Europeans first stationed themselves, they first uh, brought 
so the indigenous people were still free to a degree. They were fighting for their land that was being taken by the new sort of Dutch settlers, but they were, they were not able to be uh, broken. They were very fierce in their resistance. So the, uh, sorry, the, the Khoi Khoi people also, uh, you know, sand communities in those, in that region of South Africa, very difficult to break them. Very, very ag aggressively uh, warrior-like in their resistance to a lot of European interaction. There's a long history of that, but so what the Europeans did was they just went and fetched slaves where it was reliable. So they brought mm -hmm. slaves from West Africa, from uh, you know Asia. They brought the slaves where the slaves were, <laughs> where they could be caught <laughs> easily, mm -hmm. and they brought them to Cape Town. And so they start. So the the basis of the slave population, the enslaved population in South Africa, was this: the Africans and the Asians and um, you know, wherever the people were brought from and brought to South Africa. Mm, so mm. Um, that's why you have a particular kind of a, a demographic uh, in historical, in cultural uh, kind of admit, mixture in uh, Cape Town. Kind of so that's why that was the, oh, largely the basis of it. Um, and the, the amount of slaves, so there's a lot of, Kind of debate about that. Um, so I'm getting feedback. Yeah, I hear you. Okay. But you're hearing me. Okay. It seems yeah. that there's um, so that they would have run between. Uh, if I just take the conservative figures, about fifty to sixty thousand that form the basis of what was the Cape Dutch colonial environment. But what happened was the indigenous people were not only continuously being, uh, what's the word, uh, sort of, you know, hunted and massacred. It was basically a genocide of, of the indigenous people in the Cape. They were hunted and massacred. What these whites would do, once they, they would kill the men, so they would go hunting the indigenous people of the Cape. They would hunt them whilst for, it was a war then what would happen is they would uh, then st steal, kidnap the children and the women and then bring them into farm labor and enslaved labor in there. So that happened. Um, and then there was a smallpox. So just like what happened in the US, I mean, sorry, in the Americas, then there was a smallpox epidemic that kind of a couple of smallpox epidemics that further weakened the indigenous peoples. And again, uh, that all led to a kind of a breaking. So what they invented was a system of like, you're not a slave slave necessarily, but you are a, well, some people were classified as slaves, but the, but you are also, you know, they would bring them in as indentured. So you mm -hmm. work for this person who's your owner up until you've paid some unknown debt or whatever. So there was a lot, mm -hmm. the labor regime was near slavery, but it wasn't always defined as slavery. Um, mm -hmm. So you had a mixture of these two types of regimes. I think partly the reason is because they could not control <laughs> the indigenous population in the same way. This is, we have a small amount of settlers who can't control mm -hmm. the whole terrain because there's still a lot of indigenous mm -hmm. people in the area. So you can't create at like the kind of total institution of slavery that you can when you've captured the people and driven them over into another country across the ocean, where you can literally capture and kidnap the population and just control them there. Here, you there was a, there was a mixture of typologies, but yes, there was there were there were there were enslaved people who were classified that way, and then later. Um, emancipated, <laughs> but really emancipated into the normal labor regime which was the so-called indentured you attach to a farmer, you know, um, but they decimate all that. What they really did was they killed the, 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 the men and they uh, abducted the women and children and turned them into labor. And then mm -hmm. it's no surprise that through that, a, a new sort of mm -hmm. demographic, I don't like the word, but like a mixed population emerges from that. 
So, and the further you go in to Southern Africa, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. what used to happen is, interestingly, uh, indigenous, because indigenous people, so if, so you, you couldn't slay, easily enslave a Kosa person necessarily say, because if that person goes out to take your sheep out, they're gone. <laughs> <laughs> they're yeah. gone you know like this yeah. is what's happening with the Khoisan people as well but it's just that all their systems have been broken but you know where were you gonna catch me where were you gonna find me you know where were you go how are you gonna do it but what they mm -hmm. did do was they exported the west africans mm -hmm. and you know what those west africans did you send them out to to wash your sheep they're gone so there's a lot of uh mix of uh, runaway slaves who would be taken in by the indigenous Africans. In, in, in Durban, there was a whole black mu Muslim community. Its history is a history of, they, came, they were brought as, as, uh, on, a, on a slave ship, they were brought as slaves into, I'm not sure if it was the Durban port. Somehow, someone there was like, we're running. I don't know how it happened. I forget the story, but I shall find it one day for you. There's a whole research of this particular uh, black Muslim community. They ran. They were like, no, there's free Africans here. <laughs> they ran. So, yeah, so total slavery, very difficult. You need a more. So, yeah. total slavery, very difficult. So, take away the land. Say you what? So, I'm saying um, total slavery in our environment is very difficult. You needed more finer, subtle methods to uh, attach. Labor. So, for example, for a long time in the first part of the colony, what it was called the Cape Colony, it they they basically distinguished between um, Amakosa. So, mm -hmm. I don't know how to distinguish it without using European terminologies, but basically distinguishing between relatively farming Africans and those mm -hmm. who had been hunter gatherers and livestock nomadic herders, which was the koi koi and the sand. So they distinguished between those and said, okay, we've broken the koi, we've broken the sand. They basically should be our labor. Any other African is on that side. They still have their chiefs, they still have their kings. So we don't treat them as labor. But any koi koi, any sand has to have a document that tells us which farm you belong to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you call that? Mm -hmm. Tells us who's your employer. And mm -hmm. how did they distinguish? How do they know your koi or your sen, whatever? They just created the, the distinction in many ways by creating an idea of physical features. So, but they literally, those were the first Africans to be given what would become notorious later in South African history as the past document. In the 1700s, basically, they were given these documents like, no, if you are son or you are koi koi, you have to belong to a white farmer. Mm -hmm. This is 200 years ago. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The apartheid government, the one that everyone was protesting against in the 1950s, when they instituted much more stringent stuff like that, that wasn't new. It was, <laughs> it had been done, you know. So what do you call that? Do you call those people enslaved? What do you call them? They, they have no freedom. They can be arrested on the spot. They can be taken and, you know, put on put to hard labor. They've been broken. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they have to attach to a farmer. They have to work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I mean, as you described, that's the story of Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, Arkansas, Tennessee. You know, that's where we get the blues is, is that, those circumstances, you know? So yeah, fascinating. I didn't know that history. That's, wow, amazing. And yeah, it makes it's me important. think of- yeah. Sorry, yeah. Good. Well, it makes me think of, um, I did have this question, you know, what is the, but you're already touching on it, black political disenfranchisement in Southern Africa and the roots of it, you know, this is something that a lot of us, especially, in North America, we're not aware of. And so you talked about some of the, the, the steps, but what, 
looking back the last, I say, 100 years or so, what were the, the key dates, if you could touch on those? Dates. Okay, Not now exactly you can, dates and periods. Yeah, well, now maybe. you can tell I'm a bad historian. So key dates. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The late 1400s, 1480 some, some, 1480, 1488, the Portuguese, mm -hmm. they figure out how to stop at the Cape. They open up the routes to the East for Europeans by stopping at the Cape. That's the beginning of contact in the aggressive manner, right? With the Euro, mm -hmm. with the Portuguese. So that's a key date, those 1400s. It's very important for that to be known about South Africa because again, people think apartheid was 1950. We're talking about a process that began in the 1400s. So yes, there was no, we weren't going through the, the kind of depopulation of slavery of West Africa, but they were making their way through here. So 1400s and then then probably after then the then the 200 years between the 1400s and the 1600s a lot of europeans were coming through south africa to sort of you know look for refreshments that's when the indigenous people of the cape began to figure out that okay there's a new world they were trying to keep it within their own control uh at the same time in the 1500s in east africa the portuguese are basically removing the the, the Islamic empire <laughs> all along East Africa, yeah. right? Yeah. All the way down to Mozambique. They're ejecting and, uh, you know, ejecting the, 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 the Islamic traders, the Swahili traders mm -hmm. from East, from, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. And so by doing that, they open up two fronts into Southern Africa. Mm. So one coming from the East and one coming from the West. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it was, then they move in like this. The Eastern Front wasn't as, oh, how can I put it? The Eastern Front. No, actually maybe now I'm being too much of a South African because Mozambicans will have a very different sense of what that Eastern Front was like. Mm -hmm. um, but let's just say they opened two fronts and by, the, mm. by then the world was different. The world had changed <laughs> once that happened. The world was different because that, force of the Portuguese coming from both sides altered dynamics immensely all the way into Great Zimbabwe because also what was happening, the demand for enslaved people was reaching into the heart of Southern Africa. And some of the Southern African states were beginning to also want to see if they could sell <laughs> slaves to these Europeans. They couldn't do it at mm -hmm. the volumes that West Africans were doing it. And they also, Southern Africans didn't have an established um, slave track of so in the way that West Africa had because of the old ancient is uh, um, Islamic slave trade, Southern Africa didn't have a similar thing. So it was all mm -hmm. innovation and all new, and it was quite disruptive. So there's a there's an oral tradition collected in about Zimbabwe, one of the Zimbabwean rulers in the 1400s. And that this ruler was quite disruptive because that ruler started responding to the demand for slaves in the part in, in the, the, the rising demand for slaves uh, in East Africa. And so that ruler of Zimbabwe was seen as, as being quite disruptive. But having said that, there's the East Africa and its impact on even down into the Zambezi Valley is a whole nother dynamic. Because even though there wasn't huge enslaving uh, cultures, the Swahili traders, because of the, let me just call it the, the Arab Africa slave trade, there was, there was some slaving happening in the interior towards the coast. So, so if you look at the map of Africa, I'm not talking about them necessarily uh, coming in from the coastal tip, but there was sort of, there was a way in which they would reach into the interior. Zambia, the Zambezi region, such that they were able to uh, uh, get some level of, of, of slave uh, slaving happening, but not to the degree that you could in Western East Africa. So those, so, so the 1500s are dates because, so the 1500s, the, Europe, the, the Portuguese, they kick the Arabs out. <laughs> <laughs> and they'd like, we're in charge. 
And then the next date would be probably the 1600s because the Dutch decided to stay in South Africa. And um, then the next date after that would be, there's a couple of wars that happen with the Khoi Khoi peoples in the Cape. The use of, so Robben Island, the jail where Mandela was kept was used already from the 1600s to uh, mm -hmm. to knock up the in the the Khoi Khoi resistors <laughs> who were resisting mm -hmm. for their land, so they got locked up at Robben Island. So Robben Island has a long history as well. Mm -hmm. Then, then uh, oh, what's another key? I would say then the 1700s are key because this is when the the, the white farmlands have spread so far that they've changed a, a huge part of the South African economy and they've destroyed an indigenous people. So by the 1750s, the, 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 the Khoi people and the Sand people had pretty much ceased to be an independent people. And then comes the 1800s and then you start a new phase of warfare with those who are settled Africans. So Amakosa moving all the way up, up until Mazulu, Botswana, and so on. So in the 1800s is, the, is that. Um, and then the last, I think, critical phase is the 1870s when the gold and diamonds are discovered and everything is changed. So, yeah, I, I, I have to say, I'm not much of a, I, I always say to people, I'm, I don't, uh, the 20th century in South Africa for me is not that interesting because by the 20th century, by the 1950s, everything that happens, what you call apartheid, all of that, but all of it, is, and all of it has a very long history. And then, of course, then there's the Mandela era, you know, those are the, then the Black resistance era. So there's also all of that, you know, we can put that in the mix, you know. Um, there's, there's a lot of Black resistance history that has its own, but it doesn't, because we lose, <laughs> I, I don't know yeah. which ones are pivotal because each one, I mean, obviously there's the ones that are mythologized, like the, 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 um, there's the story of Ushaga and the rise of the Zulu as a particular group. Mm -hmm. And that's fascinating on its own. Um, but many people don't know that Ushaga never fought with Europeans. They, 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 they weren't in a position to, to attack or take over what he was doing there. Um, he, he interacted with a lot of these colonial traders and sort of kept them under his watch and really just built his own empire. And the British were still far away in the Cape and they were observing what's this thing, you know. Um, and then Shaga would, of course, die in his own intrigues. So then the, the really it's the, it's, the, it's the 1870s when Amazulu now know who these people are, the British, and they really put up resistance. And, they, and the Zulu uh, empire or the Zulu, na I don't want to say nation, let's say the Zulu kingdom and empire becomes famous for being able to defeat the British. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... And there's a lot more history, but uh, I, I think those ones, I said the, the 1400s, the 1500s when the Portuguese, and then the 1750s when uh, the indigenous people have been locked out, then the 1800s when the new wars begin. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and then golden, yeah, of course, ooh, golden diamonds, the whole world basically needs South Africa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is it the yes. number one gold uh, producing country in the world? Are we still? I mean, of mm -hmm. course we should be, you know, mm -hmm. but amongst the largest, if not the largest gold deposits in the world. But my, mining has, has really uh, shifted uh, over the past uh, 30 years. I mean, it's just not as important to the South African economy and gold isn't as important to the world economy. What was important mm -hmm. was platinum. Mm -hmm. So on the on those commodities uh, trade, it was platinum and South Africa, home of probably the world's great, uh, the platinum deposits. I think I'm not sure if we beat the Congo, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, but platinum, 
um, and a bunch of other metals that we didn't know we'd ever need until these smartphone devices were created. <laughs> mm -hmm. Cold time. Yeah. There's a whole new rush for minerals in South Africa, Congo, as you know, because of the devices. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Well, um, we're almost at the end, but I just wanted you to touch um, in closing um, to bring it to the 20th century on the legacy of Mandela. Yes. And how is he viewed? in retrospect. I remember when I was, um, when Mandela was released, I was a student in Cameroon. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was in this like bush taxi, we were going to this town and every place we would stop, it was a long voyage and everyone was crowded around the one TV, oh. in, you know, just outside of the bar, you know, they called it off license and everyone was like, just wrapped like, wow. You know, and that really, impressed upon me the the, the pan-Africanness of the yeah. moment. So I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think Mandela is just so, like the, like you, you, you it's, it's like unrepeatable that, that kind of person, you know, and his, his, uh, the way he just captured black political imagination, everyone's political imagination. I mean, I think that, you know, there's a lot of these young South Africans today who are very critical of Mandela's uh, appease, not, well, not called appeasement, his willingness to negotiate uh, with the Boers. But I think that's because they don't understand just what it was like. <laughs> they literally yeah. don't understand. Yeah. They cannot fathom. The, so the world Mandela created that's stable, which literally bears no resemblance in many ways to the kind of instability that we were. I mean, I lived in the most violent part of this country at that time. You know, Mandela was burying people every week in violence where, where, where I come from. Mm -hmm. So I think younger people who can't imagine that or who think that stuff is just numbers, who don't know what it's like to live in a space where people can burst through your door with machetes and just hack your family because you know, it's a war. <laughs> There's no reason except it's a war. The state is, is, is sponsoring some of that. You know, the apartheid state was sponsoring violence. That's what Mandela was faced with. He was faced with one of the most violent combustible situations you can think of. If you can think of any war that you've seen, South Africa was imminently in that space. So I think there is, so I'll deal with the young people that think that now and why they, they have you know, their own misgivings about the process of negotiation. But I think for most people, and I think as most people also, some of them, even as they get older, they just, just suddenly realize that what he did was really extraordinary, like extraordinary, like, and, and the kind of hope that he knew he had to carry for the world and for South Africa, to me, was an example of what you call eldership, of a true person who knows that now I am an elder. I don't get to do things because I feel like this or I feel like that. I have to do what's right for everybody uh, involved. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what that guy did. And, and unfortunately, the legacy of 350 years is bigger than one man. And if you understand that, then you know that my, what Mandela did was he really bought the country some time, gave us a kind of a sense of, okay, it's possible. Jump on it and do it, you know, it's possible. And in many ways, I appreciate that he then left, you know, he was in power, he was president for five years and then he left. Mm -hmm. It was like, okay, I'm done. I'm too old. You guys need to solve this. That was perfect. That was exactly what he needed to do. He needed to mm -hmm. get out of power and be a, a granddad for the planet, if that's what he became, so that we could actually realize that there was no other way but through us. Now, yeah. why people are critical of him is there's, there's some legitimacy in the criticisms in the sense that um, he, he was quite a stubborn person from what I hear people saying. Stubborn, but also very democratic, a stubborn Democrat. But he uh, may have 
been too stoic mm. in some of the ways things were done. Mm. Too, uh, too much of a, too much of an elder in the sense. <laughs> so too much mm. seeing the bigger picture. When at times mm. you just need to see that Winnie here, you know, his former wife is now late. Well, the late Winnie Mandela, Matigizela Mandela. That. She went through a lot. She was harassed. She was, you know, there's a lot that happened to Winnie. What the apartheid government did to break this woman was a symbol of what it was doing, not just to her, but how they were literally punitively punishing the population. So she went through high, like militaristic apartheid. She went through it. They tortured her. So she was an mm -hmm. angry person. Mm -hmm. Mandela may have been tortured, I don't know, but I doubt he went through what Winnie went through. So they became symbols mm -hmm. of an opposite experience, you know. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's mm -hmm. torture to be taken away from the kids, but it's another thing to be kept in, you know, and to go through what she did. So he needed to try to think about that. What do I do with people who have been this traumatized? And I think what he did was what we do as Black people, which is we need to swallow this thing because our future depends on us swallowing it. Mm -hmm. I think he did too much of this. I think that was the problem. And I think a lot of the young people are pointing that out, that you let our wound lie open so we could appease these ones who had the guns and the nuclear arms and the army and the, all the control. Mm -hmm. We were the tortured ones. So where was the broad thinking about what do you do with the brutalized people? I don't think people saw that in his stoicism. And he was just thinking, guys, we're always going to be tortured. We need to sort this out. And I think that was the, 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 the trouble. And so the, the young people today then view that as a betrayal. They view it because they look at the world they've inherited and they're like, yes, we're free, but we're also not free. We don't have the same uh, access. We don't have the same privileges. We don't have, we also experience racism continuously in this country of our own. The land hasn't been returned. You appease them and they have spat in our faces. They've never given up. They've never said, sorry. They didn't even ask for our forgiveness. Why did we forgive them in the first place? So a new generation is asking those questions, I think legitimately, but also I think they just also don't know. What do you do when your population is literally massacring, is undergoing massacre after massacre? So, the, so Mandela, I think, will always be, he does, he transcends. I mean, even he transcends, he transcends so much as a symbol, as a person. I think he achieved so much. But those questions will always um, remain for a younger generation. But I, I do see gradual evolution as I see sort of students, as they get a little bit older, they start to think, oh, actually, how do you maintain a stable life in which black people can live and flourish in South Africa whilst dealing with the historical problem? You know, a lot of young men had been enticed into this notion that we need to have revolutionary chaos in South Africa. Revolutionary violence is the only thing. And I think that's quite a, that thing is not, that, I, that, that, is, a, that, is, a, that is a sentiment that is real among certain segments mm -hmm. of young people. Mm -hmm. but then uh, then we'll see we'll see I, i'm always open to the fact that you don't control the social mood it may very well become quite militant to the degree that people think the only way to do this is violence and we just need to get on it with it and i've often said that would be nice if black people were organized i'm sure we could do something more militant but my, our history shows us that, in fact, violence tends to spiral out of control. So it's not actually necessary. But also that in this country, it's very easy to turn Black people against themselves. That's what they did when Mandela was released. They just started a war and said, oh, no, no, it's Black people fighting one another. They were pumping guns into township, pumping machetes into townships hiring you know militia to kill people on trains yeah so until black south africans have a method by which we can say look guys if we're gonna go the revolutionary routes these are the rules we don't have those rules 
And mm -hmm. because a lot of our populist politicians don't care about thinking about the rules because it's less interesting to think about rules of revolution. It's more interesting to mm -hmm. say, let's just have the revolution. We'll see, we'll see. I'm like, well, let's see. I mean, if we collapse into chaos, then we have to get out of it. We, we are also an African country. So we also have to go through our post-independence test. Mm -hmm. We still have to go uh through and figure mm -hmm. ourselves out and, you know, it's also recent. It's only 20 something years, really. It's like, yeah. Yeah. you know, it's within my lifetime, you know, it's still, you know, but um, I think it's a question for all black people everywhere, which is what are the rules of black revolution? You know, what should those rules be? Because we so desperately want that black revolution wherever we're standing as black people. Um, but you know, in the absence of a larger colonial and imperialist uh, uh, a world like, you know, you had up until the 1990s, in the absence of that hegemony, organizing Black revolutionary practice is a different story because we now have a completely different set of, 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 of situations facing us. You know, we are not fighting one hegemony we're now you know yeah. we're dealing with our own class differences and our own aspirational differences we're dealing with you know black elites and the problems that we as black elites create on the continent you know we're dealing with new kinds of entrants you know fighting for different kinds of resources in africa um we're dealing with different institutions now we're dealing with you know what do you do with the dominance of world, you know, um, sort of the world financial institutions and their dominance? Hell, in South Africa, one of the first things they did to us, by the way, this is a crazy nonsense. They did so much to Mandela, by the way. I also don't think our young people know what Mandela put up with from the international world. So the international world is busy smiling. Oh, we love you, Mandela, and whatever. And then they're like, first of all, don't upset the white people. Don't do that. <laughs> Second of all, get rid of nuclear weapons and whatever else. We don't trust you with shit like that. <laughs> and also, mm -hmm. can you also not spend on the public? Can you get a little bit fiscally tight? Just, you know, follow the World Bank practices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Under funding education, health, we're dealing with the consequences of that today. So Mandela was celebrated by this Western world. But they were very clear how he needs to run stuff. And as much as South Africa had quite a strong, the ANC had a strong intellectual class in it. So they, they adopted these things the world was telling them, but they also tried to do it in their own terms. And for a long time, South Africa has managed to do things on its own terms. Um, but they were not nice to Mandela. I mean, Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton was defending pharmaceutical companies as people were dying of AIDS in South Africa. So Bill Clinton is smiling with Mandela because they were same time presidents. Ne? Mm -hmm. But when Mandela was like, our oh, people need you to just deal with the intellectual property issues and we need these drugs. And Bill Clinton's like, no. Mm -hmm. Somehow later on, I can't remember how Clinton came to be blackmailed, I think by activists and, you know, now the Clinton Foundation and it's HIV work. I was like, but what were you doing? And it was in Mandela's years. It was in Mandela's years. I mean, they did not give Mandela the actual kind of support that he needed to turn the country around fast enough. They imposed on him. They imposed, and he, he had no choice. I mean, there's all these stories you hear. One day we were going to be socialist, and then Mandela comes back and he says, listen, guys, um, so I've just been to a place called Davos or wherever. <laughs> and they, yeah, yeah. Can we adapt to these things, you know, because they're basically not going to trade with us. They're not going to, they put him under pressure. Mm -hmm. You know, they put him under pressure and every now and again, he'd resist, you know, he'd be out here like, yeah, I'm friends with Fidel. You don't tell me about that. Yeah, I'm friends with Gaddafi. You don't tell me that. Yeah, me and, you know, Palestine. He would resist as far as he could. But yeah. the Western world never supported Mandela's social program as they supported him as a symbol and until we understand the pressure that that man was under and how he tried to use the, the, the our own internal intelligentsia yeah. 
to just resist and try to do what had to be done. So I have a great deal of respect for Mandela. I see him as a man who did a lot. I see him as someone who, who against all odds tried to stand and he grew into his own ethical being. He wasn't always that ethical as a young man. He was not at all ethical as a young man, but he was a firebrand revolutionary, very, very, very obstinate, you know, aggressive, uh, a resistant of the system when he was a young man, you know, mm-hmm. went through his, his, his years in jail and started thinking broadly about how do I leave a country intact? Mm-hmm. Not on his own, but like, how do I leave a country intact? And I think that's a very difficult question for any human being who, that's on mm-hmm. your shoulders. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's oh. just to say, yeah, don't, I personally don't want to hear all these people who are like he was a betrayer i don't want to hear that like we've never had to lead a whole country out of war <laughs> Even yeah not. you try it you try it and see you how try. it feels you try it yeah, yeah. yeah. Hmm. wow well i want to thank you so much for all your insight your time it's really been fascinating i've really appreciated it so much ah uh, thank you so much and um yeah, we'll continue to engage and we'll listen to your music from our side and hopefully we can meet for other, what Noel calls collaborations. <laughs> yes, we, we're doing it, we're doing it. He's the one to put us together. So got to give thanks for Noel. Thank you mm-hmm. so much. Is that, that was- Lindy right there? It, yeah, it's a bye. Bye bye. Bye. Hungry, <laughs> bye. Okay, it's time. Thank you, I'll talk to you soon. Yeah, bye. Okay.